Patricia Willkommen in the IFA Gallery. Welcome to the second episode of the Gallery Reflection, created by my sparing partner, Dr. Jonas Tinius. Before telling you a little bit more about the Gallery Reflection, I'll tell you about the space where we are. So, this is a year-long research and exhibition program called anti to tai on colonial legacies and contemporary societies. We look and try to analyze the, the colonial structures in our everyday. Behind you, it's the most stable part. That's what stays for the whole year. And it's uh, this library called the Center of Unfinished Business. And it's, um, it's a selection of books that has been curated by the contemporary end, so Yvette Mutomba and Julia Grosser, that have put together books in resonance talking about colonialism. We also have the hearing station there with the sound radio. And here it's Watch Your Step, Mind Your Head. This is the whole exhibition, and maybe we will go for a tour after the talk if you're not fix and fertig. Um, but it's, a, it's an, exhi an exhibition that is created by Marina Reyes Franco with two artists, Sofia Galicia Moriente and Irene Andre. They ask who constructs the concept of paradise and who consumes it the most, looking at the colony of Puerto Rico. That's one thing. Now, why we are all here tonight, it's for the gallery reflection. And for that, I will leave you the floor. Merci. Well, welcome also for me. It's, this, is, this is working great. Um, to the second event in the Gallery of Reflection series. Um, and thanks, of course, for coming to the IFA Gallery, which, um, as Ali has just introduced, is running this one-year program, um, as part of which we've initiated this series as, a, as, as really a, a collaboration that is more than just a series of public events. Um, this series was conceived by us basically when the whole project was also still in its conception um, and it was a way for us to try and think um, otherwise and differently about the ways in which anthropological research could contribute and become part of discussions about curatorial practices. Um, that is to say in ways that are not just in the usual ways of observing from an unmarked perspective but actually as part of um, and as an interlocutor among other people um, about questions of um, uh, the critical reflection on institutional powers, colonial legacies, and of course also artistic practices in Berlin um, at the moment. Um, an introductory essay on the idea of the series is up online now on the, on the site um, called Sparring Partners, which really again um, was based on this idea that the anthropologist is not just an observer who's, who's outside of the conversation, but actually somebody who also um, actively and passively takes punches and is kept on their feet by um, the interlocutors um, in the conversation. To accompany the opening chapter, an exhibition by artist Martin uh, Pascal uh, Tayou, uh, Pascal Martin Tayou, um, we devised a panel on the question of urban diasporas and decolonial thought. Um, and key for us in that com conversation was to combine questions about um, the hidden ways of seeing urban space with a discussion of Asian, meaning here Korean, Vietnamese, and Indonesian diasporic formations. Um, and a video of this event with the urban scholar um, Noah Ha, anthropologist um, tra uh, Chang Tran Tu, and performer Hyun Sin Kim um, can also be found online uh, on the platform. But while themes of space um, are also crucial to debates about art and colonial and post-colonial experience, so are issues of time and temporality. Um, and just now, for instance, as Ali already mentioned, we're sitting in the show Watch Your Step, Mind Your Head, um, curated by Marina Reyes Franco um, with artists Irene de Andres and Sofia Galiza Muriente. Um, and the three present a selection of works that they developed between 2015 and 2017 that ponder, as Alia mentioned, the question of who constructs paradise um, and the ways in which it's, uh, as you said, consumed but also um, continued as a concept, focusing on how this is, uh, is experienced from the Caribbean nation of Puerto Rico. Um, and the artists, as you can see, work in photography, print, installation and video formats, remixing original and sourced materials from um, various official and personal archives, as well as the internet, to construct these alternative soundscapes um, and visualscapes to the usual tropical narratives. And in doing so, they're examining and contesting the visual economy of tourism, but also paying attention to the ways in which historical narratives are rewritten. 
Um, and so behind us, for instance, now actually we can only just see um, tail tellingly the head um, of a series of three photographs um, that we had to take down for the projection, but you can at least see one of them, which is a three-part series of photographs showing the dismantled and cut apart sculpture of Christopher Columbus, um, a gift from a Georgian sculptor who was fascinated with sculpting large colonial men and gifted it to the village um, in Puerto Rico. Uh, and Columbus's second voyage, um, on which he stumbled upon uh, Puerto Rico, uh, is also shown in the long blue line on the outside um, on the window panels, um, just in case you had, were wondering what that long line um, was on these um, windows. And the idea of paradise, of course, already takes us straight into the theme of tonight. Traces, legacies, and futures on art and temporality is the theme of our discussion, and what we're interested in is to poke at and interrogate uh, the temporal dimensions of concepts we use to talk about the colonial past, present, and future. Um, and moreover, we'd like to talk through the agency and affordance of artistic practices in facilitating those inquiries. And there are many ways into this discussion, of course, um, several of which are central to auto-critiques of anthropology. Johannes Fabian, for instance, uh, in his seminal book, uh, Time and the Other, investigates the ways in which the classical ethnographic account would use the denial of contemporaneity uh, and coevalness, uh, meaning the acknowledgement that we all live in the same here and now, um, as forms of othering of non-European societies. But the three words in our title tonight also already indicate uh, the direction of our conversation. Traces, for instance, are defined as a mark, object, or indication of the existence or passing of something. And it has the beautiful double etymological meaning of a path that someone or something takes, allowing it to be a term that conjoins the past with the present and the future. It's also a term often used to refer to the detective search for remains, be they traces in ethnological museums such as the Humboldt Forum, under construction just a stone's throw away from here, um, which guards their collections, many of which part of the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation, led by um, this feisty-looking gentleman, uh, black, black belt Hermann Patzinger, who is well-trained in self-defense, um, as he likes to point out and show. Um, and these collections, really only under pressure from activists, um, gave in, leaving provenance research to look more like detective work than future-oriented sharing of knowledge. Um, and I didn't steal that image from his private collection. That's part of an interview that he's put up online, so you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not poking fun of Hermann here. Um, provenance and restitution, two issues that we'll be speaking about more, um, is at times um, entering complex temporal processes by having to reconstruct speculative um, histories in the face of a scanned and absent record of the past. The book Haut, Haag und Knochen, Koloniale Spuren in Naturkundlichen Sammlungen der Universität Jena, for instance, is a recently published example by my colleague Larissa Förster from the Center for Anthropological Research on Museums and Heritage that I work in, which embraces the speculative as a means of tackling the violent history of German colonialism in Namibia. But the leaving of traces can also be rethought as an active intervention, uh, creating new traces and barring newly made traces to be found in the distant future. For instance, um, as you've described it, Nora, um, as a, an act of um, something which we'll be discussing more in a moment, an act of techno-heritage. Um, the notion of legacies, too, is fraught and problematic, yet also ambivalent and productive to think with. A legacy denotes something left or handed down by a predecessor. So this could be, as in the title of the one-year program at IFA, in the form of continued col colonial legacies, such as architectural or urban traces that we see behind us in the presence of Columbus, a presence that is, of course, also contested in the new iconoclasm in post-Charlottesville, US, uh, 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 the United States of America, which erases and actively destroys these kinds of legacies. But Alia, with the, the one-year program of the IFA gallery, uses the term legacies here in the program in a different sense, um, especially, especially noticeable in the German translation, Vermächtnis or Hinterlassenschaft, which describes the active projection of something new into the future, the creation of future memories, of which this event, in a sense, will be um, part. And it is through the idea of the future, um, the third term in, our, um, in, in the title of our conversation for tonight, how it affects our presence, how visions of the future can shape the contemporary status quo, that we wish also to talk about ideas of shared heritage and the construction of social fantasies. Um, 
So Ali has already mentioned my three interlocutors for tonight, um, uh, who I'm delighted to have with me here, because they've worked in very different ways on these three um, temporal aspects of um, colonial legacies. Um, sitting on the far right, Khadija von Sinnenburg Carroll um, is an artist, historian, and professorial chair of global art at the University of Birmingham. Um, Khadija is author of several books, including Art in the Time of Colony and The Importance of Being Anachronistic. Um, and she's made several exhibitions uh, on the themes of chronic decolonization, including here at the, or including at the Venice Biennale, the Haus der Kultur und der Welt, and Savvy Contemporary here in Berlin. We've collaborated on a number of occasions, uh, most recently uh, on a piece of writing in which we argue why the idea of a zombie utopia might be helpful in thinking about the Humboldt Forum. Um, Sitting right next to me is Silvi Strakalakal, um, a colleague of mine from the Institute of European Ethnology um, at the Humboldt University, um, where she's junior professor with a focus, uh, correct me if these aren't correct, uh, gender, education, and the future. Um, she's author of two books and has analyzed how time and life processes are constituted via images of natural history in early ethnography. Um, but she also worked on Boasian cultural anthropology and the relations of artistic, educational, and political collaborations. Um, and she also advises various, uh, various exhibition projects, including at the Johann Jacobs Museum in Zurich. And then finally, sitting sort of in our center, uh, we have Nora Albadri, who is a Berlin-based artist and has worked since 2009 as a collective um, with Jan Nikolai Nellis, um, with whom she uh, is opening a first solo show, Not a Single Bone, uh, tomorrow evening in the uh, Nome, Nome, Nome Gallery um, here in Berlin. And their practice incorporates interventions and engagements with the role of technology on the one hand, um, but we'll also be speaking about their much speculated about project, uh, the other Nefertiti, from which we also drew the background image um, for the evening. So that's enough of me for the start. I'll see what the next image brings, nothing, so we'll go back to the beginning. Um, Nora, let's jump straight in um, about this idea of traces. Um, so in your work, you've been investigating colonial traces in museums, uh, but you've described um, in your work uh, that what you've been doing were interventions that challenge social infrastructures and institutions through s gestures of civil disobedience. Um, and in your two um, current or most recent such interventions, um, uh, again, the other Nefertiti, um, you claim, where you claim to have done um, a connect scan of the bust and made it available open access, causing a huge discussion about technology and restitution. Um, you've sort of used speculation also as a means to, to provoke. Um, but I thought maybe you could tell us a little bit more about your current project, Not a Single Bone, um, which, where you've done a similar thing, um, but not with, um, with, with a bust, but with a huge thigh bone of a dinosaur. Um, and I wondered whether you could maybe just kick the conversation off by telling us a little bit more about this idea of techno heritage and how mm -hmm. um, traces and technology intersect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Jonas, for the beautiful introduction. Um, yeah. Do you have to go closer yet? Um, yeah, I mean, I would like to start actually with the word traces because we already discussed this a little bit that um, traces is also like a term which sometimes like minimizes the the, the whole thing we have in front of us. And so traces are not as important in, in my like investigative practice, practice, if you want, because it's not the de detect, detective work. But um, what I liked always to point out with the work with the Fossil Futures Project, as well as with the Nefertiti, is it is a lot about the question of um, originality and authenticity. And uh, of course, um, let's say the Deutungshoheit, the interpretational sovereignty of museums, which they possess when they possess the actual objects. And through technology, um, this can be changed somehow. It can, it can be an emancipatory tool, but it can also be um, the other thing, definitely. If you look to Google Arts and Culture, for example, who they collaborate with, um, with museums in a totally different way, where actually the collaboration with public collections especially is leading to a copy fraud of um, public collections which then go into the digital possession of a uh, multinational like Google, for example. But in our case, um, yes, uh, our speculation was that um, this data of the objects, and this was with an FATT and it's also similar with a bone, can be um, a mean of um, renegotiating the object. It's another layer where we can discuss this in a very new way. And um, 
maybe you had another question. Well, I think what's interesting about this project in particular, so you see basically, as it says, um, this is, this is a, a visualization of the leaked data set of the bust of Nefertiti as a 3D rendering. And the idea that you would actually deliberately insert traces into um, uh, an historical yeah. record is, of course, sort of turning this idea around that traces are always something which we gather about the past. Yeah. So, in a sense, you weren't just archaeologists um, and uh, so sort of, you know, so possibly criminal archaeologists that are sort of by uh, using civil disobedience to provoke these kinds of institutions, but you're also leaving yeah. Um, yeah. sort of possibly fake traces for other people in the future to find. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, there are different traces, I would say. Like one is in the level of um, of the web somehow. That when you look now to Wikipedia, which describes the bust of Nefertiti, there is another op part of the object biography added that the data is now online, available for everyone, and that there was a ha ethical haste or something. So this is something which is written online somehow, which is another trace. But the actual physical objects, uh, object, which is very important in our practice, I have to say, because in, in the case of Nefertiti, we did a 3D print and exhibited this in Cairo, which is super important uh, as a means of recentering um, the whole idea of where to exhibit and show the object, the actual object. And then we were talking and discussing a lot um, which object now is more real, which is more original. Is it like the 3D plastic print, which is exhibited in Cairo, or is it the one which we find here, like very close to here, actually in the museum for over 100 years now, which got overpainted by custodians with new layers, new, um, new layers of paint, and how much um, of the original is actually left there. Mm. There's also a beautiful essay on this notion, like, or the act of uh, traces um, from custodians from Ben Lerner, it's a New York-based author, and he, he makes this point quite vivid, I think, when you like, add layer and layer of the paint in such a long time and rest restore the objects that much, how much is actually left. And this goes also, of course, for paintings where there is a very invasive way of um, updating the object or something. Yeah. And then, of course, you went one step further. You didn't just exhibit the object in Cairo, but you also buried the yes. object um, yeah. Yeah. again in the sand or in some sort of sand. Maybe you could tell a little bit more about that because it seems almost like, if I may be a bit provocative, sort of like an exoticization of this act of discovery that you're sort of inversing. So I wonder in what sense that's what, how yeah. you conceptualize that temporally. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is the, I think, the largest aspect of this intervention, which really deals with time and how. How we, we figure this with archaeological objects in that case, and it was, we called it always a counteract to excavations, um, because this is also a very uh, Western concept of, um, and their objects, um, archaeological objects or material objects of other cultures, are just one thing which the Western world is extracting. There are so many other things. And for us, this was um, the whole act of giving something back, and then having this as, like, what we describe as techno heritage as a future potential find in 100 years, 3,000 years maybe, like the last one, or maybe never. Maybe, I would be happy if it would never be found <laughs> somehow. Um, yeah, so yeah, this place with, a, I think, the idea of the presence also, because this is what we can do now, but it points towards um, the op possibilities then we have and the potential of the future. Yeah. Khadija, if I could just come over to you, although of course you've got these microphones also so you can inter interject and intervene whenever you like. Um, in the piece that we wrote can't in, you, possibly. You can't possibly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, in the piece that we wrote together about the Humboldt Forum, we spoke about uh, what we call palatial recurrence. Um, so this idea that um, certain palaces in that particular space have recurred and reappeared in strange mm -hmm. kinds of ways. Um, and um, there is, of course, an aspect of, of repetition and perhaps even of circularity that you know, I think is very visibly when one sees anything that is being reconstructed, but also a certain sense of, 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 a, rena of a renaissance, uh, the return of the uh, a rebirth, possibly of those that have never died. Um, and you begin your book, Art in the Time of Colony, um, I told you I wasn't going to cite from it, but I, I will, with a quote by the African-American writer Ralph uh, Ellison, wherein he says, the world doesn't move like an arrow, it moves like a boomerang. Um, and that therefore we should always keep a steel helmet available whenever we can, because it's going to hit you in the head at some point. Um, but the book, as you write, is an attempt not to study art through methods of history, but to try and understand history through art. 
Um, and it's one of the concepts that you've sort of been using in a different concept but that relates to this particular project is that of um, anachronism or that which is anachronistic. Um, and I wondered whether you could maybe tell us a bit more about that concept uh, and how it relates to, to the work that you've done with it. Put up the importance of being anachronistic because that gives us an illustration of what Nora was saying is kind of strategy of reburying a digital, um, in this case, the archaeology collection from the Cambridge um, Museum of Anthropology with a Tasmanian Aboriginal artist, Julie Goff, uh, who for 10 years, together with Christoph Balza, who's here as well, we photo documented all of these um, collections and then returned them back into the ground. So the previous image you saw, this is the cover of the book, but the previous image you saw was of that um, one of uh, hundreds of, of stones being returned back, um, as, as you were saying, returns never really functioning, of course, um, and, and always being a kind of boomerang that violently um, hits you. And uh, I mean, anachronism, I guess, is a funny neologism that is that can, in a sense, be translated as return. I mean, it just means to be out of time, to be... Um, Anna, yeah, chronistic is to, in a sense, not necessarily always read the past in its own terms, something that historians were traditionally always trying to do. Um, definitely Deutsche Kunstgeschichte is very attached to the idea of, of if we're working on 19th century colonial history, we must perhaps refer to this material in the terms in which those collections were originally collected, otherwise we're going to do it some injustice by projecting our post-colonial, um, you know, tricky kind of moves on it. Uh, but I think that actually that's obviously as artists what we do, we, we, we grapple the things um, uh, in the terms that, that, that are useful to us. And I mean, I was thinking as you were speaking, Nora, actually about a lot of these terms that, um, like fraud and like, um, I mean, like legacy also, <laughs> And, and even the idea of like who finds what. Um, it's very much from our own perspective. I mean, for indigenous people, it's not a, a fraud. It's also not um, a, uh, it's not being found. It was already always there. So I guess, yeah, in my work, I'm trying to see things in their own terms rather than always already projecting our own um, kind of historical methods onto them. Could you maybe say a little bit more about the ways in which that term anachronism isn't just a way to think about the ways in which history um, uh, repeats itself or the ways in which we can think about temporality, but also as a, as a, as a concept that allows you to do certain things. Um, you were using some of these interventions and some of these, especially in your own work, your own historical reenactments of, 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 um, of situations, as, as ways of opening or finding ways into institutions to try and not just get them to think about um, temporality and, and exchange, but also actually to performatively create situations in which, for instance, um, uh, restitutions um, are made possible. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe speak a little bit more about how, through such temporal interventions, um, you're trying to actually get institutions to change? Sure. Yeah, so if institutions recognize the, the power of returning the so-called original, whether it is, has been, it obviously has changed over time, um, usually through performance in my, in my case, usually through kind of resting the material of the past and turning that into a kind of script for uh, a contemporary, uh, not even performance, often ritual or you no know, real kind of use of material culture. Um, I know you wanted me to talk about the ICA piece, but that's not really a restitution. I mean, I've mm. brought a couple of examples of work, but mm. I can't reach the computer. Yeah. I can't reach the yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, so while you were saying that this, the idea of a layered Nefertiti, or um, in the case of the piece that I'm working on, um, what should you even show? Uh, I was thinking of the com complexity. Uh, the Restitution of Complexity is a new work that I'm um, producing for the Austrian Cultural Forum in London next month. And um, it looks at this feather crown that's in Vienna that, that uh, the Mexicans really want back, that you can see here in the background. Um, this is a still, or these are stills from a performance in which um, with Nicolas Gamsteller and other artists as part of this festival, um, the uh, Unconscious Archive, it's called. Um, we 
Well, I tell the story, the kind of very long 600 year story of German colonialism in uh, the Caribbean and, and thereby uh, kind of layer, um, yeah, if you just, exactly, just scroll, don't play it because it takes an hour, um, but if you scroll through it, <laughs> you'll get a sense of how we, or how I sort of layer um, history live as I speak my way through the main terms of, of the work. Um, yeah, but you might have to come and see that, I think, for that to make any sense. Um, yeah, what was the question about restitution? Hmm. Yeah, it's a big topic. <laughs> it's a big topic. <laughs> it's a big topic. <laughs> yeah. um, Let's, let's come back to those and shift to, to the future briefly. Um, we'll come back to the future in, uh, in various moments and uh, throughout any of these kinds of uh, discussions, I think that the future is in a sense already present. And that's, that's one of the ways in which um, the philosophers and, and, uh, and Suhail Malik and Amin Abanesia have been talking about um, uh, what they call a challenge to the overemphasis on the contemporary. Um, they've been arguing that essentially contemporary art um, through its uh, uh, um, uh, essentially its, its, its emphasis on, on the experience in the here and now has sort of created a, um, um, a, lack, a, lack, of, uh, a lack of vision uh, for the future, a futurelessness. Um, and what they've been suggesting through this notion of the post-contemporary is that um, they're saying let's look at the ways in which anticipations of the future actually shape the present um, and therefore in a sense um, allow us to anticipate certain things um, before they've actually happened, therefore influencing what we're doing at this moment. And in your opening lecture, you were speaking about what you call anticipatory anthropology, and I wonder whether you could maybe tell us a bit more about that notion uh, and how it relates to the future. Um, yes, I can do that. <laughs> so, maybe before I do that, I would, um, because it relates to um, the things you said, do I have to, no, it's not okay. um, So um, I'm very much interested in this notion of future and the two scholars you mentioned also make this observation that um, um, recently we're talking about the future very much. I mean, Martin Schulz is doing his um, campaign at the moment um, with the future. Um, and that's just one example, and we're talking about um, the future of the Ethnological Museum a lot. We are talking about the future of um, ethnographic collections. Um, you're um, talking about the future when you're um, thinking about um, 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 how to use technology in that context. And also um, in this um, series, uh, also the idea of legacy. Um, has this um, approach to future-oriented thinking and um, I'm just very much interested in um, what it does to the present and the past if we think about the future, if we employ the future um, politically because that's what we're doing, right? right? Um, also when we talk about um, um, how we um, how we want to, I mean, it's kind of a wishful thinking and also this specu speculation is kind of um, a thinking space in which we um, imagine things how they should be, like an alternative reality. Um, and um, yeah, so anticipatory anthropology is, um, I think anthropology does that already. I wouldn't, um, in my um, lecture, I didn't try to open up a new branch of um, anthropology, but um, I try to um, um, look, in, um, look how this anticipatory, imaginative, speculative element is already part of anthropology. And um, in my work on um, early um, U.S. cultural anthropology, um, you can you see this borderlands of art and anthropology. And I would say you cannot separate art from anthropology at at that time. People like Mead, Zapia, and um, Bateson um, collaborated um, with artists and dancers and um, um, filmmakers and also um, wrote poetry, um, um, made films, and also um, um, were artists in, in a way. So um, 
I think this, yeah, I, I think anthropology was um, also this um, thinking space with all its problematic, um, um, yeah, with all the problems and all its uh, colonial baggage, obviously. And of course, there are also various other ways in which that is futurism, for instance, are also deployed as political tools for rethinking, for instance, utopian or dystopian worlds and using, as it were, visions of a possible positive or negative future as ways that affect us in the present. And so I wonder to what extent some of those ideas, perhaps even of paradise or of utopia, are ways in which uh, the future becomes a political instrument for thinking about the present. You yes. disagree? Yes, I disagree. <laughs> um, I think it's um, um, what is really interesting when we think about the past or the future is um, how history is made. Because that's what you said, right? It's it's not um, it's not something which is just there, which you uncover or which you. It is. Um, it is. There is an act. There is a. There is a practice of making history, and um, I find that very interesting. I find the question of how do we use time? How do we? What are our temporal practices? Um, how does? Um, how do temporal orders work? Um, and I think we have we can speak of temporal orders when we speak about um, um, ethnographic collections or ethnographic um, objects because yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, there is also um, a sense in which this debate that we already anticipate about shared heritage, um, in a sense, is a way to try and get museums to, uh, on the one hand, open up using notions of, for instance, laboratory. Um, uh, you know, using metaphors of, of speculations, metaphors of, of uncertainty, um, to try and work out possible ways in which one could rethink an institution. And I think some of your some of uh, uh, of this particular film that you're preparing is is trying to do that. To what extent is the idea of of, of, of shared heritage um, the uh, a term that would allow us to think about um, possible other ways of uh, of, of of using uh, museum institutions and and such storages? Um, thinking about it as a term both to indicate possible future social encounters or as a way to imagine other futures, other ways of dealing with uh, the future of objects. Um, so in a sense, a, a provenance turned into the future, if you will. Mm -hmm. May I say something? It has something to do with what you were just asking, but also what you said before. Um, because when we not only talk about ethnographic collections, but let's have a look at like archaeological collections and also to like paleontological uh, now, but especially um, um, the high cultures, which are somehow labeled um, by archaeologists and uh, even ethnographers, I guess, um, as death societies. Um, and this is the part of history making and even the decision making in um, history somehow. That's, this is like, then we don't have a, even a debate anymore about shared heritage because those, all those huge collections are claimed as um, their civilization is gone, so there is nothing like sh shared heritage. That's some kind of the arguments in a lot of cases, and it's very important. And there is this um, great scholar from Greece, uh, Yanis Samilakis is his name, and he's uh, like pushing the boundaries towards an indigenous archaeology and asking questions especially about temporality. And um, in archaeology, but you could also apply this to ethnography, I guess, where he says that as soon as you do that, as you label the um, source communities or the indigenous or the ancient uh, civilizations as dead, then you um, get really powerful and that's very dangerous and like he tries uh, to push towards a totally different approach which is not um, in line with the linearity of time, which is definitely, I would say, up for discussion. And yeah, I mean, provenance is obviously instrumentalized, right, in order to not restitute things, for example, or to, to delegitimate um, indigenous peoples' claims to objects or land or um, human remains because that precise bit of evidence cannot be found or, yeah, is not available in the kind of historical written record. But exactly as you're saying, Nora, I mean, there are, and I think that in a sense, Germany suffers from being a little bit detached from its former colonies and from the source communities who 
in places like I grew up in the Pacific are right up in your face, reminding you that they are still here and they would actually like access to this material. But because the material is so far away when it's here in these European museums, they don't really have the means of coming. So although they're like universal museums open to everyone, you know, there's a little bit of a, an unbalanced sense that maybe, you know, most of those people can't travel here. Um, most of the people I work with have never left the Pacific. Um, so, yeah, a shared heritage would be one in which we completely have to rethink the form of ownership, right? The form of legal um, possession over uh, this kind of colonial loot and begin to at least make partial um, adjustments to, I mean, for one, legal structures, but also uh, the kind of access and the kind of use that that those objects are put to. And there are examples of that, and there's there's slowly, uh, I think, a rethink, you know, a, a sense that that's going to be necessary. <laughs> yes. Um, I I'm thinking of um, isn't the the concept of source community, isn't that already um, part of this temporal order? It's what you said, it's we have been, we've been there before. And what you just told us, it can be used the other way around, and that makes this term, the, the problem with the term so much um, clear, that um, once you don't have um, uh, a community who's um, claiming this kind of history, um, then you don't have a political, you, you don't have a point of political action anymore. And these programs, or the, how restitution works, I mean, works very much about this, ma making this historical standpoint, this community standpoint visible, which is kind of this um, place, placing yourself in this kind of history, which makes sense to the other person, which makes sense um, in relation to this bigger history in which this kind of history has to be integrated. And I'm just wondering um, if this kind of, um, yeah, if this is the term to do these kind of politics in the future, because in a way it bites us in the ass when there is some, no one to claim this kind of history. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the notion of the source, of course, and this is something which we um, spoke about just before, brings us back to this question of, you know, temporal experience and the way in which we speak about time is itself an achievement, uh, in, not in a positive sense, but in the sense that it, it's, a, it's a construction. Archaeology, for instance, and uh, especially the kind of archaeology that you're referring to, which is constructing narratives of um, um, of succession narratives, also, in fact, in a, in a wider sense, of course, as fundamental as uh, evolution. Um, these kinds of narratives are not necessarily just ones that are about finding out the truth, um, although, of course, metaphors of unearthing things that are providing us with evidence of, for instance, the origin of the human species, species and so on, they're often portrayed as ways of just finding out the actual order of the world. Um, but in a book that um, uh, Paul Wenzel uh, Geiser, professor at the University of Oslo, uh, wrote, which is called um, Traces of the Future, Archaeology of Medical Science in Africa, they were making the point that essentially the ordering of temporal experience is itself um, a construct achieved by various kinds of sciences. And I, I wonder to what extent the, um, uh, the metaphors that you use to describe the current project, not a single bone that you're, um, that you're about to open, um, the metaphors um, you know, of the dinosaur, for instance, what is the role of, of, of these particular kinds of animals in constructing an idea of the past um, uh, that you're challenging with, uh, mm -hmm. with this project? Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe um, I need to start uh, with a dinosaur as a metaphor and that I also see the museum as a dinosaur somehow. But uh, <laughs> the, um, what it means, like, why are, the, why are we so fascinated by this mm, gigantic bones and gigantic skeletons and by that phantasma of the dinosaur and all this? Like, you have to know that natural history museums, they have to have dinosaurs. That's like their... Um, bestsellers, their centerpieces, um, because of them they can, I know from a Scandinavian museum, 
there was never anywhere dinosaurs found nearby, so they had to buy one from the US. And as soon as they had this dinosaur, they, they increased the um, uh, per audience by, I don't know, 30% or something, so quite significant for the museum. So that's uh, one point. That's it's the best seller. But uh, why is it so interesting as speculative material for me is because, um, and this is also questioning the hierarchy of um, knowledge we are uh, engaged with here. And, and all over the place, when natural science um, uh, puts itself um, um, in a hierarchy, of course, um, over um, other narratives and other knowledge um, ideas and bases and data as well. Uh, so the dinosaur W.J.T. Mitchell um, wrote a, a beautiful book. It's really a fun read. It's called The Last Dinosaur Book. And uh, he talks about um, the dinosaur as a totem animal for our societies. And uh, yes, we are so fascinated. One point is because um, dinosaurs talk to us about extinction, and extinction is something of the future. And it's the idea or that we want to know how we are going to die somehow. And in our next project, which is called uh, um, Fossil Futures, uh, we talk about um, the dinosaur collection here in the Natural History Museum, um, where they have 250 tons of dinosaur bones from Tanzania. And they got them here during like 100 years ago, during the times of um, Deutsch Ost Africa in the colony. Uh, like it was a very violent act somehow, and all this 250 tons, everything was unearthed uh, and brought here by 5,000 workers uh, over the course of a few years. Uh, and now they're here, and no one really realizes this story here and in Tanzania as well, because everything is gone. And, uh, for me, the relevance for the now and the future is uh, that just in this um, area, it's in southern Tanzania, a few kilometers far away from this, we have um, uh, a territory which is the size big as Italy, where um, a World Bank project together with various multinationals, like even also German multinationals like Bayer, Monsanto, Nestle, they are doing some agro production there again, extracting everything out of the ground. So it's, um, I wouldn't say history is repeating, it's like a um, continuity, and I don't need any trace. I mean, I don't need to look at a little bone or something. It's totally obvious, and this is also something what we discussed in preparation for this talk, that um, somehow at one point, uh, our, I don't know, decision makers, uh, and this is like a big political step, and we don't know if this ever is going to happen, have to see that and have to articulate this. Yeah. And you used a particular term to refer um, to, this, to this project of extraction, you used the term uh, cultural fracking, yeah. and therefore, of course, making connections to what we describe as a dystopian possible future, that of extinction and the destruction of the planet, um, with a past that is, of course, seems to be remote. Um, yeah. Cultural fracking in that particular instance, could you say a word more about how you came up with that concept of exactly how you yeah. use it to describe these? Yeah, actually, I would love to point out uh, towards uh, Nikolai, who's also here in the audience, um, with whom I did the last project and this project, and maybe you want to explain briefly this term because we talked a lot about this. And yeah. I, I can't do it, but you can explain it. <laughs> <laughs> no, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think um, mm -hmm. cultural fracking we, we, we coined in, in order to uh, point out that this is the next level of um, cultural appropriation. It's not enough. Mm -hmm. Like appropriating in, in, the, in the art world, it's like already, uh, it's, it's good to steal somebody. Like uh, uh, Picasso was saying this, no? Like uh, a good artist steals, not copy. So, and um, this, to appropriate something, it's, it's, it's almost uh, uh, en vogue. And uh, to, to point out the, the brutality behind this, because what Noah pointed out, like this extraction of these bones happened like two or three years after the Maji Maji War, which was one of the bloodiest wars uh, um, fought by uh, the German colonizers in Tanzania. So this is totally linked. And um, this cultural fracking, we coined it because we extract and what we leave there is, uh, is wasteland, like there's nothing, there, there's not anymore a culture to, uh, which you can connect to, and this like, yeah. Maybe, maybe to add something to this, um, to make it more clear, because the dinosaur bones is one, one example, but uh, I think 
when there were like this um, uh, shouts like um, towards uh, getting all antiquities out of Iraq or Syria too in order to protect them, this I would also say is cultural <coughs> fracking because you take everything away then if you would do it, of course it didn't happen because uh, the people in Iraq and Syria they knew exactly what's going to happen if they uh, give it away for uh, safeguarding or whatever. But, uh, it, I mean, there was the idea, even the director of the Louvre said, we wanted asylum for objects, which is ridiculous. It's, uh, it's horrible, if you think about it. Um, but this is also some kind of cultural fracking we are talking about. I thought I might interject and offer a counter-narrative, because we wanted to talk about the future as well. And, we, and I think there's something very political about saying everything's gone, but usually yeah. everything is not gone, even no. when you've had a country mind and... And there was a, maybe put on All Black Ore, if you, if you have it there. Um, so last time I was in Berlin, I found some scientists, this is also not to, yeah, we don't want to kind of create straw men and just, um, in, indeed, these scientists had found that um, amongst the mining that has destroyed most of uh, Australian rock art, which is like 60,000 years old, was always very difficult to carbon date. Um, because it's actually alive, because it's actually a mixture of living biologies that keep symbiotically eating each other rather than being static pigment. And so all of a sudden this could be seen, it was obviously, or I think it must have been intentional on the part of the painters, was it 40 or was it 60,000 years ago, and we were talking about deep, big sort of Jurassic time scales again, but not dead and gone things like actually living paintings, uh, which is what you, well, you see here, the scientist first in, in Dalem, um, showing me how, how uh, these organisms work. And when we were preparing this, and because we were talking about the future, I think, and because we're thinking, I hope, productively about what do we do with things like the Humboldt Forum, like how do we actually make these places useful as things that get us closer to understanding or supporting other, you know, other non-Western knowledge systems rather than always only kind of mining our own ways of thinking which lead to these very dismal um, connections uh, between the past and the future. Those are the paintings we're talking about. Anyway, I wanted to throw that out because I thought we should also... Um... And of course one aspect of these particular um, paintings was that because they're constantly repainting themselves, there was another question in five which is that of authorship. Who is actually painting these particular um, these particular murals? Is it the person who initially applied the paint, or is it the bacteria that are constantly edging themselves further into the stone? So in a sense, you're multiplying and, and giving away the authorship of that particular writing of artist in that moment. Absolutely, yeah, and I, that's why I think that even the term of civil disobedience might be uh, who's civil disobedience? Why you know why is there not a social contract that the object has? Why does the object not have human rights, you know, or object rights? Um, yeah, we definitely need to use actor network theory in that way to, um, yeah, to our ends. Sorry, the sound is off, so this doesn't really make much sense. It's, yeah, thank you. Okay, may I add something to this? Um, because uh, network actor theory, you are totally right, I think. Um, uh, our idea or our approach in, in the Fossil Futures project is not that um, the territory now is wasteland and is, all possibilities are gone, culture is gone and there are all poor people there who are living there today. That's definitely not the case and uh, in, the, in the case of the Tendaguru, this region or the um, site of the finds, um, uh, nature definitely took over again and it's a very um, special place and a beautiful place somehow with, to me, a lot of... Um, options uh, for the community to work and they are using it still and it's a ritual like spiritual or uh, place and uh, it's so it's it's still a living place mm. that's for sure and it's something in the, yeah i don't know <laughs> i i find this um this um idea of um authorship and um whose history and um and uh, the agency of the object really interesting because I think um, what I tried to, um, what I was um, asking um, before um, when I said, doesn't it bite us in the ass, um, is not to focus, or maybe it is a possibility not so much to focus 
on um, certain, um, not only on certain um, um, positionalities or subjectivities, but instead of focusing on the practices, because um, I very much believe that um, practices of collecting, practices of classifying, practices of putting an object into a very specific um, location, exhibiting um, this, um, copying it, discussing it, changes this object and also changes its aesthetic throughout the time. So it is maybe we need to think more in this um, 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 practice way um, and um, yeah shift from because then you don't you cannot assign objects easily to um, one history because they are part of many histories or part of um, something which is um, more complicated than um, history. And um, then you might think that restitution is not enough. What else do we have to do with these objects? I just, yeah, I just think this, when the discussion ends with restitution, then um, for me it's just um, reiterating this kind of temporal order which we try to criticize. It's, um, sometimes it's um, even absurd to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's why I think um, it's interesting what you're doing because you're exactly um, playing with these narratives. You're speculating with it. You're in, um, you're um, offering a different narrative. You're um, you you're making yourself part of um, this history. You're you're changing it. You're doing something else, something more. We could talk about appropriation. Everyone can also get a drink while we talk if you're fading. And feel the speaking, speaking of which, we've already introduced yeah, the possible. Yeah. <laughs> we've also already shown that the, the microphone can travel into the room. And I yeah, think so uh, speaking about time and temporality yeah. also means uh, speaking about uh, um, finite times, uh, which we have tonight. Um, so we'd like to just open this up to further questions and comments that might be um, there from the audience to any of the panelists or comments on the theme itself. Um, and we've got two microphones that can travel. Yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat> Just a, a, not thought out, well thought out thought um, to begin with. Just um, <laughs> connecting to what Sylvie that? just said about um, maybe restitution is not enough. What else do we have to do? And maybe this connects to what all three of you have been saying. Um, Taking the institution's point of view, everyone is really afraid of restituting. Like, if we give away one object, we're going to lose all of them. Talking about the Berlin context, we have about half a million in the ethnological storage and exhibition spaces. So it's actually not even imaginable who would take back 500,000 objects. And I think everyone knows that this would be an endeavor that would just not, like be never-ending, which is interesting because this... To, to start this endeavor would be a really interesting project, like where would this go to? But so the fear of losing objects is very telling. And, but of course, the real politics is many people, many communities, whoever they are, don't even, may not even want the objects back. Some of them say, you know, we are happy you have them because we don't have to deal with them. You know, there's all kinds of different positions. So I think it's really interesting to to ask, or I think it's important to ask this question of what else do we have to do because restitution on the one hand focuses too much on the question of the source and therefore also on the question of belonging, which is a tricky one, but also it, it, it's, it, it focuses very much on, 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 on the act of something that for many, many, many objects is, will just not be possible. So if, if it's not possible, what else is there to do instead of just keeping the status quo. And therefore, I think this question is, 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 on the one hand, a very kind of interesting theoretical one, but also a methodological and, 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 you know, pressing one, because 
talking about shared heritage, of course, for many is a way to also keep the status quo because you can keep the objects here and, and, and invite people yeah, invite who them. most of them may not even be able to come because they won't get a visa. So yeah. I think that's interesting in terms of connecting past, present and future ways of, of dealing with these things. Yeah. Maybe um, like to, to add to your comment or what we were discussing also about temporality in this case is um, I like to think much more like a, I think it was Siraj Rasul who coined this like a museum as a process. And but what I like from this idea that um, it has to be a constant place of negotiation. And the moment we are negotiating here a little bit, like not here, also here, but uh, in, the, in the public discourse about um, the objects. Um, so it starts, and I think um, constant is the important word here. There is no solution. There won't, will never be an end to it. But um, what is important, I think, is that we're going to have a discussion and that, that we have an open-ended discussion and an open-minded discussion, which is definitely not happening now because it's driven by fear, by institutional angst, uh, which I think is completely illegitimate because uh, there are so many other examples all around the world where museums did that actually progressive museums were open, were discussing uh, in an open way, and uh, of course, none of them had to give all the objects back. That's the, just the idea. It's actually kind of a joke, but uh, yeah. Yeah, and I, f I find this fear very interesting. This, um, which is this fear of the institution and this assigning of positions. These are the post-colonials, and these are um, I don't know the art historians or the um, ethnologists or the museum ethnologists, and. <laughs> When I think about the post-colonial uh, as, um, as a historian, it is a colonial history. This is not like, this is history, and then we have this colonial history, and we have, yeah, we have to work on this colonial history. This is not yeah. how, it works. how it works. It is um, part of the museum. It is not something um, uh, you can, like, talk for, in a minute, or which where you have the post-colonials who are kind of dealing with that topic. No, th this this is embedded in our thinking, in in the object itself, in the classification, in the architecture, and how we think about our ourselves. And at the at the same time, it is, in my um, opinion, from my historical research, it is very much an entangled history. It is there is already agent there is agency of the other. There is not just um, this act of classification or collecting. So I think we really need a more complex understanding of history and of um, thinking about history. And um, I think the temporal is um, is a very um, important thing. And the post-colonial, the idea, it's not something which comes after. It is something which is ongoing, what you said. It's something never-ending. It is something um, which is um, which is an open-ended process. It will never be, there. there is no end of this debate. And it is not just a debate, it is, it, it goes on. That's one of my problems with entanglement, actually, because it, it implies that you could disentangle something and then you'll be done with it, in a sense, rather than having, um, yeah, having some a colonized kind of mindset. That 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 um, I was just thinking as 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 you were saying that, like to have a first world kind of angst, like how ridiculous is that? What are we really? If we and actually, I wish yeah, Christoph Balzer would say something behind because he's doing his PhD on. Um, very much the kind of psychology of the museum. Oh yeah, and we can plug the new book as well. There it is. <laughs> uh, so I think there's a lot to there's a lot to be said there. I don't know if you do you want to make a comment. I actually have a question. Okay, yeah, go on. Um, you were mentioning. Um, uh, the source communities, and you were criticizing this um, this expression, and of course everyone is talking about why this is so such a difficult uh, terminology, and um, I would also not like to refer to cultures as a as a resource for our museums because that 
delegitimizes them in a certain way. So do you have a proposition? <laughs> do you have an idea how to refer to them properly? Them. Them is good. Just keep it at them. them. Them's fine. You know, yeah, it's, all, it's, we've I mean, been doing that for a long time. Just all kinds of all kinds <laughs> of interest groups that um, that have a specific interest in museum collections, probably colonial, uh, colonially acquired collections, indigenous communities, not necessarily indigenous communities. How do you refer to them these days? I, I think that the museum needs to, the museum as an institution, uh, <laughs> that's my heretic um, <laughs> thinking about this, um, needs to get rid of this notion of belonging. Um, but not in a way that it can keep everything. I think I, I'm totally up for um, giving stuff away and f freeing things. I just really like that notion that you're freeing um, <laughs> not free TV. Um, it's, um, yeah. But I think this um, notion of belonging um, is, is a problematic one, and I think we need to work with other concepts. And I think it is um, the task of the museum to deal with these. Uh, I think it's the responsibility of the of the institutions who hold these collections of uh, come up, coming up with um, a critical way of thinking about history and also their own um, investment um, in this history. Because I very much think that um, that they are using this notion of source communities as well and that is my problem mm -hmm. I don't I don't have uh, I think restitution is fine yeah do it um, it's it's if it's not if there is no belonging it's also not yours it's um, so I think there needs to be a different way of discussion I mean, it's easier said than done, though, do it and, yeah. you know, just use a different term. The problem is that in law, these national museums, since sort of the French Revolution and France is the most extreme, has in its whole constitution the idea that this is national patrimony and you can't take from the French citizens who, you know, managed to get everything back from the king, then, you know, somehow dissolve that. And so you have that so... The, I've started working with lawyers a lot because it's obviously the only way of actually making it possible is then to, to undo that law, and it's really not easy. I mean, it happens occasionally. There was a case for Maori heads from France that sort of made one exception to that um, heritage law, but, it's, yeah, it's really difficult. I mean, I'm a, yeah, I'm, it's protected behind a kind of firewall, like the British Museum has a, there's a, in the British law, a particular mm. case that you cannot move anything outside the walls of the British Museum, the physical walls. And until you change that law about the wall of the British Museum, nothing will leave. The Elgin Marbles will not, mm -hmm. you know, oh, they yeah. might be lent to the Hermitage just for fun. Yeah, but they might be lent. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that there are particular terms already that you raised, uh, Fred, just now in your question before, that trouble that, that, that idea of the source community in the sense that it already implies this idea of something going back. It's a backward-looking um, sort of concept that uh, tries to reduce and exhaust the potential of objects and the potential of, of, this, of, this, of this act, of this potential relation, in its bringing back, in the conclusion of a case, as it were, where again this, this sort of detective metaphor comes in. And the reason why I say that this has to do with the way in which we conceptualize the, the practice of, of curators and, 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 museum, and museums is because in those notions of the curator, the person who takes care, in the notion of the, the keeper or even the guardian um, of world cultures as you know, certain of these positions are referred to, there is an idea that one is for a while, as it were, um, taking care of things. One is, one is also, and this is a term that we haven't touched on yet, um, but, but that is highly relevant, one is conserving, one is, one is sort of putting things into a place where they can stay. Um, as though the rest of the world, or the original context in which they came from, was sort of dangerous to them. Um, and this idea that the museum, in that sense, is sort of a, a, a savior um, who might allow for things to go back to their status quo, well, which of course over time has changed as well. I think there's a temporal logic in that, um, which which is just flawed from the beginning. And ideas to th ideas of thinking as museums and as these kinds of um, actors 
as open-ended, future-oriented um, practices that, is, that are not just um, finishing or concluding a relationship, but actually building relationships that will last beyond the restitution, I think that is really the temporal logic in which we should be thinking about those, um, those practices. But um, Otto, may I, because uh, you actually gave us a glimpse of an answer to your question earlier, I think, at least, as I understood it. And um, I also think a lot about, uh, because we, what we talk is very human-centric, so talking about source communities is also human-centric. So when we go and think more about the post-human and the agency of the objects and the agency of the nature, of the territories where everything came from, uh, this would also change uh, the debate completely, I think, and it's very revealing that, for example, in the political science, there is not much um, conceptualizing about this yet, but it's starting, and it's actually changing the power structures in which we think, because, and this, in the end, like, if you think it through, this also would have definitely legal um, uh, follow-up, which, which would happen then, and I like very much to think about the agency of objects as well in this case. Yeah. And maybe just to to um, clarify, I think it's um, I think this discussion on um, restitution um, polarizes so much yeah. that it closes this kind of discussion. Yeah. Yeah. You cannot think about other relations yeah. than this kind of temporal relation, which is which again shows how powerful this temporal order is. Yeah. And this order was incorporated into these objects when they were collected. I mean, and when we talk about the Humboldt Forum, I think it's so interesting, for example, how these um, uh, personalities like Forster or um, um, Humboldt are employed in these uh, debate because when they were talking, when they were writing about, for example, I worked on <coughs> pictures of on India um, and in German Indophilia in the 18th and 19th century, they were very much um, talking about history in a very reflective way. They used German, the German histo or they constructed the German historical position within a global colonial setting via these um, um, art um, objects and via their, um, their correct and proper understanding of the cultures of the world. I mean, Forster and um, Schlegel, Herder um, uh, propagated this idea of Germans are, can understand other cultures better because we don't have colonies. Mm -hmm. We are the true understanders of art um, and culture. And so this is already so embedded in this, mm -hmm. um, in this whole um, notion of scientific curiosity, which I find, um, yeah, it's mind-blasting how easy apparently it is to reiterate this 18th century um, idea of being the good curator, of being the truthful, safe guardian of culture. It is really nothing new. It is something um, which apparently works really well. <laughs> Hi, so, um, uh, I guess a lot of the conversation that's um, been had has been circling around the idea of heritage as a material thing. Um, but I guess I would like to propose the question of um, moving towards um, the idea of heritage as intangible. And obviously this is not only just, um, I mean, I think, well, first of all, I, I, I want to clarify that heritage as a term is used by you know Western um, nations to to propagate this um, history and agenda, uh, but now I think it's also very relevant that international organizations like UNESCO would propagate the idea of intangible heritage, or um, which is you know like I don't know methods of storytelling with indigenous populations. Um, but with that said. Um, Heritage, to take it a step further, is in a way also a brand because UNESCO and, I guess, Western nations have, have done, um, have used it as a term. So I, I guess I want to ask specifically Khadija, because you've been, you said you were working with lawyers um, to, to work 
with ideas of restitution, uh, sorry, sorry, not ideas, um, just restitution in general. In what scenario can you foresee sort of the, re the redefinition of ideas of heritage, not just in the public space, but so curators perhaps have a position in that, but in terms of anthropologists, what are their roles in terms of reconceptualizing the idea of heritage as perhaps more of a brand rather than um, a material object? I mean, anthropologists have, because they're so practice and future oriented and do field work and sort of see that people actually use materials outside of sites like the museum, which was, of course, the, you know, the curator also comes from the church, actually, was a, was a you know, a, cler a clerical position in its etymology. So once we move out of those kind of moribund sites and back into places where heritage is lived and is not just a kind of branded um, and therefore already usually um, the problem with the intangible heritage a lot of the debate is that it, it, it kind of once you define it you shut it down and it can no longer kind of breathe an appropriated change and, and kind of live properly. Um, so UNESCO yeah, struggles and thinks about all this and I mean the 1970 law is the UNESCO law is still the one that's kind of being used and I think that um, yeah, it needs to be kind of updated, I suppose, and is constantly being worked on. But the scenario um, is always a political one. I mean, there usually needs political will for these objects. I mean, these objects in these cases usually kind of disappear, and what's going on is a negotiation between different sort of state powers. Um, so, yeah, I mean... God, what scenarios? There are lots, but there are platforms. There are, you know, hope there are potentially platforms like anthropologists in enlightened museums. <laughs> um, I don't know, creating opportunities for, for, uh, yeah, for more sort of something more lived than a than just a brand that's very cynical. But yeah, there is a very interesting engagement with that question um, by the anthropologist Heidi Geisler, who's based at UCL in London. Uh, and what she's been doing is she's been trying to uh, work with this debate around heritage and, 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 and restitution by comparing it to issues of copyright, um, which of course are also about intellectual property and not so much about material uh, property. And the second um, 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 aspect um, that she's dealing with in, in her work, which touches on your question about the materiality of heritage, which uh, is, uh, was quite prevalent in our discussions, is that, of course, with the, the usage of possibilities for sharing, um, say, images of particular objects, or, or, or generally the, the, uh, the relevance of technology in these debates, you're, of course, questioning other ways in which you could be sharing um, at least access or awareness of particular collections. Because I think that what some of the commentaries have been pointing to is that there is also simply not an awareness or, 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 or enough information about what is in certain collections. And so, of course, without that information, how are you going to even begin to search um, um, for any of those kinds of collections? I'd rather, I'd I think rather also, rather. just to add one more thing, I think the, the, your provocation of making replicas is really powerful. There's a strategy of... Um, once we loosen this attachment to like an authentic original and we can see that, that copies might also be efficacious in ritual practices, something anthropologists have also studied for a long time, that we see that um, the relationship between this kind of precious or fragile museum object and the many replicas that are made of it um, do not undermine the kind of value of, of, of either of those um, kinds of objects. So I think we, I mean, I think we just have a very sort of unrefined relationship to objects. I mean, on one hand, humans are obsessed and, and sort of live through objects. On the other, they, they always need to feel superior and kind of undermine them. So I suspect that if that becomes a little bit more sensitive, then that's one way forward. Yeah, yeah. If you don't mind, I'd like to return for just a moment to the, um, the notion of cultural fracking, um, which I think is a very interesting idea. Um, I, I guess I'm slightly concerned that it might misuse the notion of fracking a little bit, but I don't think that matters very much. Um, what I'm interested in is the particular example you're referring to, Nora, uh, uh, about Monsanto via. I ask because I work for a U.S. nonprofit helping small-scale U.S. farmers 
Pike Monsanto for many years. <laughs> so I have a glimmer of an idea about what might be happening in Southern Tanzania, but I'm very curious about that. And I'd, I'd, I'd appreciate if you maybe say a few words, of, a few more words about that, and mm -hmm. perhaps tie it to the larger context that we're now discussing. Possible. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, but before I can, like, I want to go one step back and then I go come back to Monsanto and this uh, specific territory. Um, when we look, for example, at the paleontology, um, which is, and we have discussed this also in preparation to this talk, and we haven't even touched this issue of the, um, like, being creative in science and scientists as artists or, yeah, even like creating um, images and creating knowledge, narratives, whatever, in the creative act like artists, uh, paleontology um, in, the U in the US, and you know, let's say it's America, for example, um, it was the bone hunters who came with the colonizers and the settlers in the four, they, they spearheaded actually um, the appropriation of the um, territories. Um, and it is like, uh, so this is for me the bigger context that this seems to happen everywhere, that those gigantic bones somehow sim symbolize what is happening now in land grabbing, or um, in this specific World Bank project, it's land grabbing, but it's also, um, what is it called in English, Vertreibung? Um, dispossession. Yeah, dispossession, exactly, of small-scale um, uh, subsistence farmers, uh, and everyone who is living there um, had to leave this specific, and it's as big as Italy, so you can imagine what kind of effect this has. But uh, funny enough that this, pro um, this project was promoted as helping um, small-scale farmers mm -hmm. and uh, it was criticized like, so, like in a mild way, um, but it's definitely not uh, thought out enough in the public realm and we want to talk about this in our project and maybe to, to give you like the context um, of what we are doing. I mean, we do a lot of things in this Fossil Futures project, but actually in the heart of the project is something what we're going to do next year. And this is like a response to this land grabbing. It's, uh, counter is always like whatever. I can say counter land grabbing because um, the area of the Tendaguru Hill, like I said, it's a very special place. It's like 80 square kilometers um, big um, in, in the um, forest. And uh, we want to build there a museum, but a uh, um, non-invasive museum without bricks, because we don't want to um, just copy a conventional museum. And the community there commissioned us as artists to bring back somehow, um, in an artistic way, of course, the bones, because we cannot just go to the museum and get them out, um, by now at least, somehow. Um, and uh, so, and in this process of building a museum there with AR and mixed art, so it's, it's again, it's a multi-sensory experience and that's actually important because um, when you talk about heritage and heritage sites and bringing objects in museums, that's not, not multi-sensory, right? That's um, not only um, detached from the context where they were, but it's not multi-sensory anymore. And uh, in, in the process of doing this museum there, we, we're going to have, we have like um, a plan um, and the first steps are already implemented with the regional government to have this area um, a self-sustained and self-managed forest reserve. So this area cannot be land grabbed um, by anyone anymore. And it's, it's like then self-sustained by the community. And they have, so they have, of course, uh, and it's all about economy. I mean, when we talk about museums, it's definitely also about economy. Uh, and, and it's about territories and economy. So for me, this is like the framework, um, the bigger framework. I think economy is a spectacle as well. That's one of the issues we were, we were raising just earlier, the idea of particular objects in certain museums serving as sort of, as, um, as uh, you know, as a, as a draw for tourists. And of course, this is something which um, is so interesting in this current debate about the Humboldt Forum where, you know, the, the, the Humboldt Forum will be in the center of Berlin. And that itself raises particular issues and particular potentials for the, the kinds of museums and the kinds of institutions that will be within. Because ethnological museums, and I suppose that was in a sense the, the focus of our discussions, treat particularly sensible objects that have, um, that, that, that sort of sit awkwardly within uh, the tourism industry of Berlin Mitte. Um, and the idea that people would um, sort of go into these places to gaze um, at particular objects. But what's happening at the same time is, of course, that the old campus in Dahlem is available for different kinds of uses. So, and that sort of that situation on the periphery, as it were, of, of, of Benimitter, I think, offers us an interesting way of linking um, the debates that we've had with 
that of, of territory and space. Um, and that's, I suppose, another aspect of the cultural fracking that we haven't touched on, which is so far, and looking at this uh, image up there, we've been speaking about mobile objects. I mean, mobile in the sense that they could potentially be moved. Of course, they're sort of immobilized by being brought into certain kinds of spaces. But what you're raising is the issue of, of um, as it were, immobile um, heritage, of immobile land that can also be altered and affected um, and by the same kinds of general and bigger processes that we're talking about. Um, other questions? I'll wait the usual seven seconds. <laughs> But you also can just talk about uh, with us after this. And so, yeah. if no other question arises, then we invite you to stay with us in the gallery, um, grab another drink, and uh, continue the conversation with us. The next gallery reflection, I believe, is taking place on the 16th of November, and it will be dealing with the question of um, intersection, intersectional um, feminisms and art, um, and it's responding to the next chapter um, of the one-year program. And of course, you want to invite us to come along and we'll keep you updated. Yeah, so thank you, John. Join me in thanking you. Uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>